I've always been fascinated by nomads. Constantly on the move. This most beautiful journey. Surviving in some of the world's most remote wildernesses. Where's the removal van when you need it? <laughs> and living cheek by jowl with nature. It's always seemed a wildly romantic existence. It's the most magical place. But it's no easy life. It's the sort of cold that makes you feel physically sick. And in today's modern world, <laughs> they're under increasing pressure. I'm going to live with three groups of nomads. In Siberia, so you're kind of an exhilarating feeling. Nepal. Namaste. And now in Mongolia. San Beno. With a family of herders who are adapting to the 21st century deep in the Gobi Desert. Clearly, this is a way of life that is very, very precious. But life here is still dominated by the power of nature. As storms and predators constantly threaten their nomadic way of life. I can't stand here and say, don't kill that wolf. It's not my place to. Mongolia's wild and untamed Gobi is the largest desert in Asia. It just looks like the sort of bleakest, emptiest landscape. And the idea of, of living here and making a living here is um, hard to imagine. Yet it's been home to families of nomads for centuries. I'm on my way to stay with one of them. It's just going to be really eye-opening, I think, to, to discover this partnership between them and their livestock and this landscape that has allowed them to thrive for this long. But Mongolia's nomads have had a checkered history. In 1924, the country fell under communist rule. For nearly 70 years, nomadism was banned and the herds were collectivized. But with the arrival of democracy in the 1990s, an incredible one-third of Mongolia's population chose to return to their nomadic roots. Today, it's believed that 30% of Mongolians are nomads. But once again, their way of life is under threat. The country is going through an economic boom fueled by mining, which is tempting nomads towards a more prosperous and settled way of life. There is something very romantic about the idea of nomadism. Often it isn't romantic when you see the reality of it. Often it is an incredibly hard life. It's a 600 kilometer journey from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia's capital, to the southern half of the vast Gobi Desert and deep into the Three Beauties mountain range. I want to know what's keeping nomads here. The family I'm staying with move four times a year with the seasons. At two and a half thousand meters above sea level, this is their spring camp. San Beno. San Beno. I'm Kate. <laughs> Kate, hello. Thank you for inviting me to stay with your family. <laughs> Chimid is 78 and the head of a large family. She has 10 children. Her youngest daughter, Ordna, lives with her. And can I um, have a look around? Will you show me around? Exactly. Okay. okay. What is happening? Oh Ordner is married to Serigo, 
and Chimid's youngest son, Batok, is staying with them to help with the busy Kashmir wool harvest. Oh, look at these. The family own an impressive 200 goats, 150 sheep, and over 100 yaks and horses. So these Kashmir goat? Ah, another one. He's hungry. You can just see uh, some lovely black and brown and white dots on the hillside. Ah, Terry's job. And that's all the adults coming in. So all these little ones are going to get a feed in a minute. So it will get very noisy. <laughs> the animals are like the family's bank account, their meat and milk providing food and their wool and income. In Mongolia, they're key to nomadic success or failure. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Are there many wolves in this area? Bear. Yeah. Oh dear. I'm not allowed any more goats at home, but I might have to make an exception. They all live in this communal tent known as a gare. It's their kitchen, living room, and bedroom. Tell. <laughs> Has this always been your home? Yes. Chimid grew up during the communist era, working on a state farm with her husband, who died two years ago. Their return to nomadism in the 1990s revived a long heritage. And Chimid proudly displays her family's heirlooms in the roof of the gare. It's beautiful. It's not a Well, is it, this is my wedding ring. This ring belonged to my husband's grandmother, and inside there is engraved the, uh, the word 12th. And uh, she was married on the 12th of September. My parents also got married on the 12th of September. And me and my husband got married on the 12th of September. So three generations got married on the same day. So it's very special. Yeah. <laughs> Life is fragile out here in the Gobi. It's vital to keep their animals safe, especially at this time with the newborns, like this gorgeous two-day-old foal, the first of the year. If those family heirlooms remind them of their past, this new foal is a potent symbol of their future. It's the most magical place. The film crew and I are camping a few hundred meters up the valley from the family. 
clearly this is a way of life that is, is very precious. And they're here with dignity. They're not living in abject poverty. There just seems to be a huge amount of sort of, well, I think pride is the only word I can think of really in the, in, in the way that they live this life. It's ten to six. First morning, waking up in the Gobi. There we are, morning, everyone. Not a sound. It's so quiet. I haven't even washed my face for you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Meeting the family yesterday, which is always quite nerve wracking, because it's a big leap. You're kind of just stepping into their lives and hoping that they might take you in, and and uh, that's a big ask. But it was just a really lovely, lovely start. Every morning begins with rounding up the animals. The relationship between man and beast is the bedrock of nomadism and goes back millennia. <laughs> but Chimid and her family enjoy some of life's modern amenities too. And on what do you run off here? In Girdasan. Girdasan, Tulutrasan. Most nomads in Mongolia are embracing modernity. Why not if it makes a tough life that little bit easier? Whether it be a solar panel, or a 4x4 to help fetch the water from the local well. From their current camp, it's an eight-kilometer round trip every three days. And before you had the car, so maybe when you were a child, how would you have collected the water then? <laughs> I can't move it on my own. I'm sorry, I'm not you. Okay, okay, ready? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> wow, this is not easy. Us, us, us. The adult goats and sheep are separated from their young so they can graze on the surrounding mountains. The 4x4 was perfect for fetching water, but to follow the herd, nothing beats a horse. This is the most extraordinary saddle. I feel very perched up, very upright and rather elegant, but only when I'm standing still. So you want me to keep the... Rain short. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And feet forward. Right. If I can walk by the end of today, it'll be a miracle. Okay. 
Mongolians are famed for their horsemanship, and like Ordner, most learned to ride from the age of four. Back in the 12th century, it was horsepower that helped Mongol warlord Genghis Khan create one of the largest empires the world has ever known. Horse is... Mur. Uh, Yama? Yama? Goat. Goat. <laughs> Hon? Sheep. Hon. Today, we're using horses to help keep an eye on the livestock and to protect them from predators, foxes, wolves and snow leopards that roam these bleak mountains. Mountain. Mountain. Yeah, mountain. Mountain. Yeah. Mountain. <laughs> Oi. Oi. <laughs> so yama is goat, and I goat. can teach you in the English. So what is yama? Yama. Goat. Uh, goat, you see? <laughs> yeah, so we've been teaching each other. And on... Sheep. Sheep. <laughs> We're getting good. <laughs> and mur. Horse. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we've had, I've had a little language lesson. <laughs> I'm practically local. <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness. Ordner spends wow, much of the day the watching the flock, but also finds time to do her beautiful and intricate sewing. Did Chimid teach you to sew? Mama Baha. So do uh, the men sew as well? Will your husband sew? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in, in my husband, he's better than me. He's good. He has a sewing machine. <laughs> so is it always your job to come out with the sheep? Yeah, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? I haven't met your son yet. Does he not live with you and Chimid? Oh. Mm -hmm. So who looks after them in Dalan Zagbad? Ordner's children, aged 15 and 13, only come home during holidays and for special occasions. So did, did you do the same? Mm -hmm. Under the old communist system, a strict education policy helped achieve one of the highest literacy rates in the world. It continues today, but to get an education, children must still go to the local towns and cities. And as those cities grow, young people are being drawn to the modern world and away from their nomadic culture. <laughs> And your children, Ordna, will they be nomads? Yeah, I mean, it's good to stay. I'm just saying, I'm not going to get started. 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 I'm not going to get I suppose what I'm, I'm gradually unpicking about this way of life is, you know, Ordna went to school, but she's chosen to live this life. You know, no one's stopping anybody progressing, but I think they are aware that their knowledge is meaningful. Um, that it does allow them to survive and it allows them to live a life that they choose. They want to live this life. Um, they have an option to be somewhere else and yet they want to be here. I'm 
Today is a big occasion in the nomad's calendar. All of Chimid's sons, daughters and grandchildren have come together. Every year, the family unites to castrate the young male animals. Did you learn from your uh, father how to do the castration? Yeah, it's for you. Be or you should have to cut or Now I can come and sit beside you. First, it's the young stallions. <laughs> How often do your family all get together? When do you see everybody? Next, the goats and lambs. All the smoke around here, as far as I can gather, is, is almost like a sort of healing smoke. Um, part, again, very much part of this ceremony. It's a lot easier than a horse. <laughs> with a quick blessing, the lambs released. It may look harsh, but Batsock's doing it with real respect for his animals. Oh dear. It's a rite of passage. Think of it that way. <laughs> The iron-rich testicles are believed to have health-giving properties, but the real treat is to boil them in salted water with yellow rice to make a rich soup. There's a lot here. I think I've got more than my share. Um, it's like hundreds. I've got... So, these... You just do that? Really? <laughs> okay, now you've done it. I'm going to have to do it. Mine's bigger than yours. This one? Like that? <laughs> oh, don't make me laugh. It'll be a disaster. Okay, ready? Mm. Actually, that's quite good. <laughs> It's not chewy at all. It's very soft and rather delicious. Oh, my goodness, ah. my poor little lambs at home. Okay. They've got very fine testicles at the moment. I wasn't going to castrate them this year, and now maybe I will. Okay. No, 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 no. You must give everyone else. They are. I am not interested. Today, I'm going 15 kilometers down the valley to visit Ordner's sister, Surin. She and her husband, Sengel, are still in their winter quarters in a sheltered spot on the edge of the mountains. 
Tomorrow, they're moving to their spring camp. Hi, Surin. Hello, how are you? How are you? Like most nomads in the Gobi, Surin and Sengal move to the same spring camp every year. It's deep in the mountains and at this time should be full of fresh grass. Looking around, there are animals every, everywhere. It must be quite hard herding them around here. It looks like they can go right up into the mountains. You must be very fit. So you all seem um, very relaxed for a family who is about to pack up your whole house and move. How do you decide uh, when to move from this, your winter quarters, to your spring and summer quarters? If you didn't move, would you feel that you'd lost some very important part of your identity? Thank you. We're all sleeping in Surin's gear tonight. The crew and I, Surin and her family, all squashed together. I have a thing about communal sleeping. I just think sleeping is something that should be kind of quite a private thing. You know, you've sort of been with people all day. I wasn't really looking forward to it. But, <clears throat> well, to put it very simply, I slept incredibly well. It was lovely and warm. Um, everyone was very well behaved. There was no nasty smells or noises to keep anyone awake. And what a beautiful morning. With a busy day ahead, everyone's lending a hand. Surin's brother-in-law, Serigo, has brought his truck. The gear's an amazingly simple structure, with a canvas outer to protect against the wind and the rain, a warm felted sheep's wool liner, and a wooden frame to hold it all up. So what next? No. Isn't it funny? Men always have to pack the car. Always. Last on the truck are the youngest animals that can't make the arduous journey on foot. That's so clever. That's just genius. There is something lovely about that ability to be able to up sticks and go whenever you feel like it. As long, obviously, as it's the day of the dog, the cock, or the horse, I think. It's taken less than four hours to pack the entirety of Surin and Sengal's home. Once, a herd of yaks would have carried it over the mountains. 
Today, it all fits onto Serigo's truck. But their most valuable possession, the herd, is still driven the traditional way, by horse. This is a wonderful experience. But it wasn't this romantic view that brought so many nomads back to this way of life after communism collapsed in the 1990s. High inflation and food shortages made life in towns and settlements unbearable. So families like Sirens chose to return to nomadism in the desert. After four hours heading steadily uphill, finally, fresh mountain pasture. It's been a day-long, 10-kilometer ride over the mountains to get to the spring camp. Oh, very good. Homemade gears like this one are found across Asia. It faces south, so it gets the warmth of the sun and is away from the prevailing bad weather. A gear is often given to a young couple when they get married, and they'll use it for the rest of their life. Are you happy with your new, uh, with your new home, with your new spot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could I could live with this view, I have to say. <laughs> it's pretty special. It really is. За 3 сар шахуул байна да. Энэ ч өвс сайт, хоол сайт. Өө ч юм төрөө байсан өвс нь их. The next day, back at Chimids, there's sad news. Under cover of darkness, wolves have killed the beautiful young foal. Do you lose a lot of your livestock to wolves? If you find where the wolf is, what will you do? Yeah. Yeah. But Batsok also believes that predators bring some benefits. I don't know what I'd do if I was in his situation. I simply don't know. He's the one that lives here. He's the one whose livestock are being killed. I can't, I can't stand here and say, don't kill that wolf. It's not my place to. I'm <laughs> 
Ordner and Chimid are taking me to their local stupa or shrine. It's four kilometers up the valley from their camp, just below a holy mountain. It's a Buddhist place of worship. During communist rule, Buddhism was banned and many temples were destroyed. But with its collapse, Buddhist traditions returned and now Ordner and Chimid can practice their beliefs openly. As we turn the wheel, our prayers drift out on the wind and to the corners of the earth. Chimid's eldest daughter's camp is just 500 meters down the valley. <laughs> Sitsuga has asked me to help comb her Kashmir goats. <laughs> After China, Mongolia is the world's largest producer of Kashmir. It comes from grooming out the goat's winter hair. For nomads like Tsitsuga, it's an important cash crop. <laughs> So do you just do this once a year? A kilo of raw cashmere sells for around 70,000 tugriks, or 25 pounds. With her flock of 250 goats, Sitsuga can earn up to four and a half thousand pounds a year. <laughs> Tell you what, in another few days, you're going to have to do this to my hair as well. <laughs> as we comb the goats, the weather outside turns. During spring in the Gobi, Mongolians talk of having four seasons in one day, turning from a blue sky to a snowstorm in minutes. But this blizzard's nothing compared to the harsh winters, when fierce storms known as suds often sweep in decimating herds. In 2010, a severe storm was estimated to have killed a staggering eight and a half million animals. Thousands of herding families were forced to abandon their way of life. Sitsuga may earn good money from her cashmere, but one bad winter could wipe her out. Do you hope that this way of life um, will continue, say, for your grandchildren's generation. This is the view that's greeted me from my tent flat this morning. Basically, it's a whiteout. It's 
So um, I'm all wrapped up in every layer of clothing I possess. Last night it was a it was a pretty wild night, and um, at around 3:30, the dogs were going absolutely mad, which made me think. I wonder if that means that there's a lot of wolf activity. I just wonder, with all the commotion that was going on last night, whether they did come back. Batshock decided to leave the foal carcass out for the wolves. With cubs to feed, the chance of them returning was high. So it was an opportunity for us to put out a night vision camera to see if we could catch the wolves in action. Um, I just wanted to show you what the camera found. Do you want to come and see? <laughs> so you can see this is the foal here. You can hear the dogs. But watch what happens. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> 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 In the spring, everybody does say the weather is uh, unpredictable, or predictably unpredictable, I suppose. And yesterday was a day of blizzards and dust storms and freezing temperatures, and you literally couldn't wear enough clothes. And we are woken up this morning to the most beautiful sunshine. And um, all of us, all, all, we're all in kind of, spring clean mode, lots of shaking out of sleeping bags and washing of hair, which is a completely pointless exercise because in about two minutes, I'm going to be down the hill with Ordna, sorting out her sheep and covered in dust again. But you know, a girl's got to try. We're heading off to the local town of Dalan Zaggad to sell some of the family's cashmere. Don't we have around? It's a three-hour drive through the mountains, and spirits are high. <laughs> I have a feeling this is going to be a dangerous day, going to the big city with two nomads. The last time they were in town was over three months ago. So before you had a car, would you go by horse to the town to sell the cashmere? Dalan Zaggad is the provincial capital with a population of 18,000. Like many urban areas in Mongolia, it's growing rapidly as the younger generation is tempted by modern city life. But it's also home to former nomads whose livelihoods were ruined by the storms in 2010. <laughs> Ordner and Sarago are meeting a cashmere trader by the side of the road. 
Mongolian cashmere is said to be the finest in the world. The combed hair will be processed into the fine and highly prized yarn in the capital, Ulaanbaatar. That's 250 pounds for 10 kilos of goat hair. <laughs> Since the end of communism, the production of Kashmir has grown to become Mongolia's second largest industry. Ordner and Serigo take me to the local supermarket to spend some of their hard-earned cash. <laughs> This is our home. For me, it's a very interesting idea that you can hang on to your nomadism and your culture and your traditions, which they most certainly have. But equally, you know, they go to the supermarket and they buy a shed load of sweets. I think it's sort of rather pragmatic nomadism. <laughs> Mongolia's economy is booming, and not because of Kashmir. Large mineral deposits have been found beneath the Gobi, and mining has become the country's biggest industry. It's estimated that it will grow by 30% over the next few years. This newfound wealth is having a negative impact on Mongolia's nomads. Do you think that uh, more and more people will be tempted away from nomadic life and go into mining and into industry and move to the cities? <laughs> It's hardly surprising that young people are being tempted away when the mining sector pays up to $2,000 a month. 13 times what most herders can make. But this family has a large and valuable herd. As well as goats and sheep, they are the proud owners of a fine collection of horses and yaks. Yaks are supremely adapted to life in this harsh landscape. They used to carry the family's possessions when they moved camp, but with 4x4s and trucks doing the hard work now, yaks are kept as a symbol of pride and prestige, as well as for their milk and wool. That's fantastic. That's just magnificent, magnificent scenery. There is nothing cooler than a yak. <laughs> In two days' time, there's a yak festival in a neighbouring valley, and the whole herd will be on show. You look out at these, you know, seemingly barren hills and think, how on earth do you keep livestock alive? You know, these animals are as canny as their owners when it comes to making a living out of this landscape. It's lovely to watch. The family have invited me to go with them to the Yak Festival, but I need to be properly dressed. Ordner has made me a dell 
a traditional Mongolian overcoat. It's <laughs> amazing. She's very, very clever, your daughter. So do you think I look OK for the Yak Festival? Yeah. Sorry, I won't let your family down. It's the day of the much anticipated Yak Festival. <laughs> Just how Mongolia manages its transition to a modern global economy, yet maintains its rich nomadic heritage, is a difficult balancing act. But festivals like this, set up by the regional government to support nomads and to encourage tourism, are a step in the right direction. And they're a wonderful opportunity for nomadic families to come together. Do you speak English? I do speak English. I am studying, I want to speak English. You, you are, and doing it very well. I'm studying English. Yeah. Do you understand? I understand completely. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Over 300 yaks have been herded into the valley. The festivities begin with yak rodeo. Next is a competition for all the family. What do you want me to do? The men must catch a yak and shear it while we make a rope from its wool. <laughs> We were a little bit slow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't help more. <laughs> And now, like any good Mongolian spring day, it's starting to snow. <laughs> and in the grand tradition of all country fairs, there are prizes galore. Tiska has won the best female yak. Woohoo! Chimid looks so delighted. Look how proud she looks. This whole festival is about restoring yak herding to this province and, and, and remembering how important these animals are to the nomadic families here. But most of all, I've just had a real sense of how nomadic families may live these very remote and often isolated lives, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a really strong sense of community and tradition and culture. And today has been all about that.
With the festival over, my time with Chimid and her family has come to an end too. These look beautiful. What are they called? Bort. 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 They're hard to do. Hard to do. It seems like you've ma managed to um, to partner in a very successful way tradition and modern life without uh, affecting um, the, the, the sort of heart of nomadic life. Is it a good life? It's just been the most fantastic privilege uh, to to be here, and I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> There's no doubt that nomads across the globe are under threat, and the odds are stacked against their extraordinary way of life. But here in Mongolia, at least, I'm cautiously optimistic. This is modern nomadism. With all its traditions, with all its cultures, absolutely intact. But these are people who are not shying away from the modern world at all. Chimid and her family have shown me that there's a place for nomads today. And I'm really hopeful that their descendants will be here in centuries to come. Thank you for everything. This is clearly not an easy choice of life. Um, and I think that's what makes me admire them even more. They are nomads and they're fantastically proud of that and they seem almost as much part of this landscape as the mountains and the birds of prey and the wolves. Wanted a car, but the prize for getting a 147 had just been slashed, so did Ronnie the Rocket O'Sullivan go for it? Well, it's the Claire Balding Show, next. <laughs> <laughs>